Now, if you would uh, join with me, bow your heads, and we'll uh, begin in prayer. Jesus, in you alone, our hope is found. You are our light and our salvation. We pray that you would teach us tonight through your word, and that we would come to know you and trust you more fully through it. We pray this in your name. Amen. The uh, seventh chapter of Daniel provides us with a very interesting portrait of human history. In that chapter, Daniel writes about a vision that he had one night. He sees a series of beasts, each representing a kingdom that would have power over the nation of Israel. The first beast represented Babylon, the second Medo-Persia, and the third Greece. And then Daniel says, after that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. This individual, this little horn, is who we would call the Antichrist, a title that in, unfortunately does not mean what most of us think it means. In English, the word anti means against, and that informs our understanding of who this individual is. But in Greek, the word anti does not mean against. It means in place of. The Antichrist is not someone who is against Christ primarily, but someone who is accepted in place of Christ. He is the false Messiah. This horn, this individual, had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire. Fort was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and, the, and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. In my vision at night, I then looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion, unlike the dominion of the four beasts, is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. As our text opens in John chapter 12, we are told that it was six days before the Passover. On the first day, Mary will anoint Jesus as we might expect a king to be anointed. And on the seventh day, on that Passover, Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus asked, Is that your own idea, or have others talked to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants were, would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you'd say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. And with this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. I'm calling this lecture House of Cards. I have two divisions. The first division is titled The Hour Has Come. 
and it covers the first 26 verses of John chapter 12. Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 12, and as we do, we remember that last week, the raising of Lazarus prompted a response from the Jewish leaders, and they were plotting to kill Jesus. We were told that at the end of the last chapter, that if anyone found out the whereabouts of Jesus, they were to report them to the authorities. But in spite of that, we see in verse 9 that a large crowd of Jews had found out that Jesus had returned to Bethany near Jerusalem as the Passover is approaching. And rather than report him to the leaders, they instead come out to see him and also to see Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. And we are told in verse 10 that because of this, they made plans to murder Lazarus as well because he was a living testimony to the resurrection that had been performed. The Jewish leaders never denied the fact that he had been raised from the dead. It was impossible. There were too many witnesses, and he had been dead for too long. Jesus had been very deliberate about the way he handled that situation. So the next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Now, to give some background, it was required by law that all Jewish men had to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. As such, the city swelled with people during this time. In fact, historical records of the amount of sacrifices offered for the Passover around this time indicate to us that there were millions of people coming to Jerusalem. So we have great amounts of people in the city already, great, amount of, great amounts of people coming up into the city, pilgrims, and great amount of, amounts of people coming out of the city because they hear about Jesus. These people who are coming out to him take palm branches and go out to meet him, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. There are a couple of things we should note there. First of all, Hosanna is actually a transliteration as opposed to a translation of save us, we pray. And it comes from Psalm 118, which is one of the Psalms of Ascent, which the Jews would sing as they made their trip up to Jerusalem for the Passover. It would be the equivalent of singing Christmas carols at a Christmas occasion. And the text reads, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Yahweh has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Yahweh has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Yahweh save us, or Hosanna. Yahweh grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. Now, that phrase, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, or comes in the name of Yahweh, is actually in and of itself a messianic reference which the crowd understands based upon their follow-up statement, blessed is the king of Israel, which is not a part of that psalm. But there's one last thing that we should take note of, and that is the fact that they took palm branches. It's very important, but if you're looking for its significance in your Old Testament, you're not going to find it. Around 167 B.C., a very significant event occurred. There was a ruler by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a very significant figure in biblical eschatology. He went into the temple in Jerusalem, slaughtered pigs, unclean animals, on the altar, and set up an idol to Zeus in the most holy place. This defiled the temple and is used as a picture of what will happen in the future by Jesus in Matthew 24 when he speaks of the abomination of desolation. Paul uses this as a picture of what the future false messiah will do in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion or apostasy occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. What will this man do? He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Antiochus Epiphanes is used as the prototypical example of what this looks like. This is the character of false messiahs. They make the people of God worship themselves rather than God. I told you that story to tell you this story. 
After Antiochus defiled the Jewish temple, opposition arose among the Jewish people, and there was a significant family that led a revolt against them, basically by guerrilla warfare. And they were able to take back control of the temple and the, and the city. This event is commemorated even today by what the Jewish people call Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication, remembering the reconsecration of the temple during the Maccabean Revolution. And if we were to read the account in the books of Maccabees, the apocryphal books that record these events, we would find that when the Maccabees were victorious in their revolt, the people honored them by throwing down palm branches for them. So what are they doing by throwing down palm branches for Jesus? They are saying that they want him to be another ruler like that. They want a revolution. They want him to throw off the ungodly pagan Gentile rulers that control them. They want him to be a political revolutionary. And while we're on that subject, another explanation is needed. We hear a lot about the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the biblical account, but there was another group among the Jewish people that was even more prominent at this time, and they were called the Zealots. The Zealots were the ones who were really in opposition to Roman rule, and they were more likely to be among the common people. They were the ones who wanted revolution and to overthrow Roman power. And it might interest you to know that in the days leading up to the destruction of the temple in, in Jerusalem in 70 AD, the zealots did end up taking over Jerusalem. And they threw out all the Roman coins and minted their own. These coins had an inscription on them that read, for the redemption of Zion. And do you know what the picture above that inscription was? Was palm branches. That is the type of king they want Jesus to be. They want him to be a revolutionary. They want a coup. They want war. But that is not why Jesus came. Verse 14 opens with a duh in the Greek, which can be translated but. They pick up palm branches to hail him as a revolutionary, but Jesus finds a young donkey and sits upon it as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. That's a quote from Zechariah 9.9. Let's keep reading there. I will take away the chariots, the instruments of war from Ephraim, and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. This is the rule that Christ brings. His rule means the end of war and peace to the nations. That's not what they wanted. He offered peace. They wanted war. They wanted a ruler on a war horse. He rode a donkey. Why do you think that in just a few days they will shout, away with this man, give us Barabbas? It was because Barabbas had already proven himself to be the type of Messiah that they wanted. He was an insurrectionist, as we read a moment ago. He was one of the zealots. And so were probably the two men that were arraigned to be crucified with him. That's why they were going to be crucified. Yet, before we are too hard on them, perhaps we should examine ourselves. Do we, unintentionally perhaps, reject the words of the true Messiah and accept the boastings of false messiahs? Do we not, in effect, say, if we do so, we will not have this man to reign over us. Give us Barabbas, please. Why do we do so? Is it because we forget that we live for the eternal kingdom of the Son of God? And do we instead seek to prop up our own houses of cards? This is the character of false messiahs and false prophets. 
They may claim to bring peace, but they cannot. Jeremiah says, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They promise utopia, but they can't bring it to pass. Meanwhile, the Pharisees see the mass of humanity swarming Jesus, and they assess that the whole world has gone after him, which leads to the next part where we see that being true. Verse 20 says that there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. This was actually somewhat common at the time. The Old Testament had been translated into Greek in a translation that we call the Septuagint, and many, many Gentiles, as a result, had come to have an understanding of the true God. However, the only way they could worship him was at the temple in Jerusalem, because that's just the way it worked in those days. So these Greeks, like the Jews around them, have come to Jerusalem to worship the true God at the Passover. Now, something quite possibly has happened in the interim between verses 19 and 20. We know from the Synoptic Gospels that Jesus drove out the tradesmen from the temple courts after the triumphal entry. Let's talk about that. The temple was divided into two main parts. The inner court, which consisted of the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could enter on the Day of Atonement, and the holy place, which was exclusive to the priests. Then there was the outer court outside, which consisted of the court of the men, which was exclusive to Jewish men, the court of the women, which all Jews could enter, but only Jews, and the court of the Gentiles, which was the only place that the Gentiles were permitted to go. It was in that place that the Jewish leaders allowed the tradesmen to sell cattle for sacrifices. Let's get some perspective. You're a Gentile, and you have come from a thousand miles away to worship the true God, whom you have come to recognize as the true God. And when you get there, the only place you can worship him has been turned into a cattle drive. Then comes a man who, in your estimation, seems to be quite a popular figure that everyone seems to be talking about. And he makes a whip. And he empties out the court of the Gentiles. And he says, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. You would probably want to meet this man. And so they come and they say, We would like to see Jesus. And Jesus makes a very interesting statement. All through the Gospel of John, we have read, My hour has not yet come. But with the arrival of the Greeks to see Jesus, he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What was it about the arrival of the Greeks that signaled that? Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7, which talked about the Son of Man. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign powers, power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And just like we read in Zechariah a few moments ago, we see that this kingdom is not just for Israel. He is not just their Messiah. He is ours as well. He, as 1 John 2 says, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not ours only, but also the Jews, but also the sins of the whole world. And so, with the arrival of the Greeks is the Son of Man, is the sign that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He said in chapter 10 that he has other sheep that are not of the fold of Israel, and they must be gathered in as well. 
Revelation 7, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hand. And they said, Salva and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This salvation did not come by a political uprising, by the blood of the Lamb. So I ask you, who is your Messiah? What kind of deliverance are you looking for? Where do you place your trust? My principle is this. Only the true Messiah can offer true salvation. Only the true Messiah can offer true salvation. My second division is titled Final Rejection. And it covers from verse 27 to the end of the chapter. Jesus says in verse 31, Now is the time for judgment upon this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. In using that language of being lifted up from the earth, he is both making a, a comment about the fact that he will be crucified, as well as using the language of Isaiah 53 which speaks of the suffering servant of Yahweh who is pierced for our transgressions being lifted up. Now, when Jesus says he will teach, he will draw all people to himself, he is not teaching universalism. Remember that this hour he has been speaking of has been triggered by the arrival of the Greeks. That is the context. In other words, he is not just the savior of Israel, he is the savior of Gentiles as well. When he is lifted up, it will not only be the Jewish people that are drawn to him, the Gentiles as well. Again, John 10 says that he has other sheep that are not of this fold. They need to be gathered in as well. Not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. But Jesus has now combined two concepts. And this is what gives the crowd trouble in verse 34. Because they recognize the, what the language of being lifted up means. And that is seemingly in contrast with Daniel chapter 7, which speaks of the Son of Man who receives an eternal dominion. So they say, we have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man will be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Are you speaking of some other individual, Jesus? Are you saying there is some other Son of Man? The Son of Man is supposed to be glorified and receive an eternal kingdom. How can he do so if he is dead? To which we would remember that Jesus has just said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. But Jesus does not answer their question. Instead, he tells them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light in order that the darkness does not overcome you. Remember back to the prologue. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. It's the same phrase here, actually. If they accept the light, the darkness will not overcome them. If they do not, it will. If they do not accept Christ now, it will be too late for them. This is something we don't talk a lot about in modern Christianity. We like to speak as if salvation is always offered to the sinner. That's not really true. There comes a point when the light goes out and that individual receives all the light that they will ever receive. There comes a point when the light goes out. We'll speak more to that in a moment. And with that, Jesus leaves them. And keep in mind, there's an emphasis upon remaining with Jesus in the Gospel of John. But now Jesus leaves and hides himself from them. And it says, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe him. They are like their ancestors before them. Who in Deuteronomy 29, Moses said, Your eyes have seen all that Yahweh did in Egypt to Pharaoh, to all his officials, and to all his land. 
with your own eyes, you saw all these great trials, these signs and wonders. But to this day, Yahweh has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, our text says, Lord, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is the opening of the prophecy of the suffering servant, the very prophecy itself that would speak of the one who would die for the sins and transgressions of the people. It was prophesied that it would not be believed. Verse 39, for this reason, they could not believe. And note that language. They could not believe. They were not able to do so. Why? Because Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. That comes from Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah receives his commissioning from God. Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 8, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And we like to stop there because it makes a great message about evangelism. But it doesn't stop there. Isaiah volunteers, and God says, Go tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Isaiah is shocked. For how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged. The same message that brings salvation to those who have faith to believe does nothing harden the hearts of those who reject it. Note that in verse 40 of John 12, it says that he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. And the he, who he is, is referring to is given in verse 41. It is Christ himself who has done the hardening, just as Isaiah did the hardening back in Isaiah chapter 6. And this is confirmed by Isaiah's prayer in Isaiah 63, verses 15 through 19, where he asks specifically to God, Why, Yahweh, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so that we do not revere you? Again, it is consistent with Deuteronomy 29. To this day, Yahweh has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not accept the things of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Therefore, they could not believe. And if you think, as many do, that God is unjust as a result, where were you when he laid the foundation of the earth? Claire, if you know, Read the rest of Job 38 and get some perspective. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Romans 9. But the question remains. Why did God, did God harden his people and cause them to reject their Messiah? And that question is addressed in Romans chapter 11 which quotes the same passage in Isaiah. And Paul says there that it was for the purpose that the Gentiles would receive salvation. Jesus' mission was not a failure because the people of Israel failed to believe. The mission to the Gentiles was not plan B. It was God's plan all along. Jesus' mission, mission was not a failure because the people did not believe his message. It was a success because he was faithful to proclaim the message, even if that caused the rejection of the nation. It's a question of what do we see as more important, the glory of God or the glory of men? 
Because the temptation is to water down the message to make it more palatable to those outside the church or those inside the church. But a false message doesn't save, just like a false messiah doesn't save. My principle is this. Success is determined by our faithfulness to God, not by the response of those around us. Success is determined by our faithfulness to God not by the desire, or not by the response of those around us. What do you desire? The glory of God or the glory of man? This leads to the last thing we'll take note of tonight. In verse 42, it says that many of the leaders believed in him, but there's something interesting about that in Greek. In the Gospel of John, believing is always presented in verb tenses that have an ongoing action. In other words, it's not about whether you believed something in the past. It's about whether you are believing it. It's a continuing believing. It's an ongoing thing. But here in verse 42, John uses the aorist tense, which emphasizes a completed action. Rather than saying they were believing, John says, they believed, giving the impression that they had come to an intellectual understanding regarding Jesus. But it's the next verb that makes it really sad. Because we would expect the verb believing to have the ongoing aspect. But instead, it's the next verb that does. Instead of their, uh, their believing being an, of an ongoing nature, their ongoing action is that of not confessing. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory of man rather than the glory of God. It's why they were afraid to confess their faith in Christ, and it's why the crowd will ask for Barabbas in just a few days. It's why humanity looks to false messiahs, political or otherwise, rather than the true one for salvation. Because they value the fleeting glory of man more than the eternal kingdom of the Son of Man. Now let's look at ourselves. Where does our loyalty lie? Whose glory are you seeking? Man's? For God's. I'll close with 1 John 2. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist or false Christ is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. The Jewish people rejected their Messiah. And when the zealots that they desired took over, it led them to destruction. They forsook the eternal kingdom of God for a house of cards. May we learn their lesson. Father, in you alone our hope is found, and your Son is our only source of salvation. Help us look only to you for our hope and not to anything or anyone else. For you are our only life and salvation. I pray this in your name. Amen.